This is episode 228 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Developing Regenerative Medicines with Dr. Stefan Irian. Hey everybody, we are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we have Dr. Stefan Irian from Blue Rock Therapeutics on the podcast to talk about the company's mission to develop regenerative medicines for intractable diseases. We also have our usual roundup of recent highlights in stem cell news that's coming right up. But first, we'd like to remind our listeners about Cell Therapy News, a free weekly newsletter brought to you by Stem Cell Science News, summarizing the latest research, news, jobs, and events in cell therapy research. Use Cell Therapy News to stay current with the latest cell therapy, gene therapy, and regenerative medicine research. Subscribe at www.celltherapynews.com. All right, Arun, I'm going to get the roundup going today with a story from our guy at Stanford, uh, Serge Pasca. I mean, he's, I call him our guy and I'm calling him Serge like he's my close friend. He's a very close friend to the show, Dr. Serge Pasca. Uh, but I don't want to over familiarize him. I guess I just wish that he were in the room with me right now so we could chat about this story. But alas, we'll have to wait for a future episode. You know, Dr. Pasca works about these organoids in all sorts of ways. And we've recently talked about, you know, we're always talking about all his methodologies. More recently, I think these assembloids, which was a a conceptual shift where, you know, combining multiple organoids to create these circuits, um, which are very relevant in the brain in particular. Uh, But that's the thing, right? A critical challenge for understanding the brain, human brain, period, but specifically in in development and and disease is that we lack access to uh, brain tissue specifically and particularly during development, you know, only aborted fetal tissue will do. And uh, that comes from a range of stages and is really scarce uh, until, of course, uh, introduction of human pluripotent stem cells where we can get at any developmental window uh, in, in humans and many aspects of human neural development have been studied but more recently it was a bombshell that kind of broke open the organoid field Um, that's no short shrift paid to the optic cup i just want to emphasize that these neural organoids really set us on a path across the field that um we really haven't looked back uh so yeah human cortical organoids they've been made um but there's still some limitations in their application right uh If we want to use them to understand neural circuit development and function, we've got to uh, apply them in a a situation that mirrors their physiological milieu, right? And it's unclear whether the maturation of these cortical organoids is constrained by the fact that they don't have the same cues that they would have in a developing brain. Um, And also on the other side of that, uh, you can't integrate them into real circuits uh, that will generate behavioral outputs, right? Because that's what the brain does. Uh, It it controls behavior. So it's hard to really model uh, the link between uh, maybe genetic or neuropsychiatric disease and the phenotype if we don't have that behavioral output, right? And and, and many efforts have been made to try and crack this using transplantation of neurons into intact brains. Um, And that's been done. Uh, Neurons have been transplanted to rodent cortex They survive, they project, they make connections with the host neurons uh, and machinery, but it's been done in adult animals, right? So that limits how much integration you're going to get in a fully formed brain, and you lack the developmental context that would probably be amenable to uh, a a more coherent integration. Um, So... Uh, Sergio and, and also Carl Dieseroth, I should ask, uh, add there. I mean, it's nice when you have a, a Hughes investigator, future Nobel Prize winner right down the hall from you. So they, they, they tapped into this uh, idea of integrating cortical organoids in rat brains to see if they would uh, develop further. And they did. Uh, they developed uh, mature cell types that integrated into the sensory and motivation related circuits. And we're going to circle back to that. But first, you know, just boilerplate, you got growth. They looked at MRI to show that there was growth, persistence, and growth uh, of these organoids. Um, 
and they did some omics single single nucleus uh, profiling to show that they progressed uh, further than you would get in vitro differentiation of cortical organoids. And they displayed more complex morphological, synaptic, intrinsic membrane properties than their counterparts that you would get from generating them in, in vivo. And of course, uh, working with iPS cells here, so uh, you have to establish in terms of proving the principle that there were defects in these neurons that, uh, uh, that were derived from uh, individuals with Timothy syndrome. So it showed you could reproduce, recapitulate these pathological phenotype in the cells. Uh, and, and this was the real, you know, big part of this story, which I think superseded any efforts to integrate neurons into rat brain is that they showed they behaved. There was this whisker deflection thing uh, that was not, of course, this is why uh, D. Saroth was on the story. This was all optogenetics. They showed that they could shine the light and get this whisker deflection which is straight out of sci-fi. And more than that, they had this behavioral readout, which is licking behavior. They uh, associated licking behavior with a, a reward and show that they could train these mice, mice with just the optogenetic cues um, in, in the human cortical organoids to, to, to train them to perform this licking behavior on, on demand. So I think across the board, I mean, this addresses the disease element with the Timothy syndrome, just, you know, the surgical cellular integration element just, you know, from the start. And then all these behavioral and functional outputs on the back end, I think, made this one of the most complete stories from soup to nuts, stem cells to, you know, engraftment and behavior and function in a mouse. Uh, very, very impressive. Just another feather in the cap of uh, the Pasca lab and, 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 you know, another treat to read. I really recommend it to all the listeners. Yeah, this is a fantastic approach and fantastic paper coming out of uh, Sergi Pasco's lab, which certainly has had a slew of top-notch papers. We had uh, Sergio himself on the show recently, and also Tomas Khan, who actually did some Timothy syndrome modeling himself when he was a, a grad student in Sergi's lab. I think there's a couple of, you know, it, it, I really like the papers where if there's a figure that really just drives home the message. And to me, figure 2A, which is just showing the the, mature, the, the maturation of these neurons, either ex vivo or in vivo, uh, you know, you have a small neuron in vitro, which is just uh, extending not too many processes, but then you transplant those neurons in the cortical organoids in vivo, and you have these massive processes that are generating from these from these neurons that are transplanted in vivo. And it's just so day and night to see the improvement in the overall superstructure of the neuron after being transplanted. So to me, that in itself is, is good enough. But certainly like what you're alluding to, they did a whole slew, a whole ton of different experiments to really validate that there's an improvement in the transplanted neurons and the transplanted organoids. So absolutely, I think it, it's, it's phenomenal. The one thing you alluded to was that this greater sort of work has been done for many years. You know, people have been transplanting human neural tissues into mice and rodents for a very long time. And most famously, I believe Irv Weissman also at Stanford ran into some ethical considerations when doing this sort of work in the early 2000s, but that, that's a little bit different. Here we're talking about a more of a developmental model and also a disease model for Timothy syndrome. So uh, just the the latest feather in the cap of the Pasco lab. Yeah, them at Stanford, they, they love to put neurons into brains and introduce all these ethical dilemmas. Uh, or probably leader amongst them, but they've done it responsibly. I'll say that. And uh, I think it's important. I, I mean, I, I say it joking, but I think it's really important because as soon as we get into this idea of an external, you know, stimulus, in this case, light stimulus linked to behavior and with human, you know, neural tissue in a mouse, a lot of people are going to be thinking about, you know, little, I guess, mouse like militarized robots that are controlled with optogenetics. I don't know. I think that this is, it's, 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 it's very uh, delicate, I think, in terms of how they approach this and this story, not just technically, but I think in terms of being smart about how they approach and all the permissions above and beyond. So again, hats off 
to you, Sergio, and 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 all the uh, scientists that took part in this um, monumental uh, effort and achievement. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be running into Planet of the Mice anytime soon, Daylon. You know, famous last words. Right? And I gotta, I gotta keep my eyes open for this stuff, partner. <laughs> well, you do live in New York, so you never know. <laughs> Moving on to another story uh, that's in the neuro field from Shubing Chen, who's actually, of course, also at. Cornell, just like you. Uh, this is a cell stem cell paper entitled A Human iPSC Array Based GWAS Identifies a Virus Susceptibility to Locus in the NDUFA4 gene, a gene I have never heard of, and functional variants. So I think there's a, a few reasons why I really like this particular paper. And one, because they're taking it back to a virus before the virus that we all talk about today, which is Zika virus, which remember used to be all the rage and used to be really the focus of the, the research community a, a long, you know, four years ago, it seems like a lifetime, right? Um, and so they were able to basically identify that there's a particular gene and mutations in this NDUFA4 gene through a, a large GWAS, actually, genome-wide associations study uh, approach, um, there's mutations in this gene that can confer susceptibility and resistance to infection via Zika virus. But the other cool thing about this is they extended it to the viruses that we're all talking about now, including SARS-CoV-2, um, and that some of these mechanisms are also conserved in regulating the susceptibility uh, to that virus as well. So we can dive a little bit deeper into it. GWAS has been around forever. Okay, genome-wide association studies have been one of the most famous approaches and you know technological approaches done in human genetics over the last like I don't know however many decades, right? So population-based studies to identify disease-associated risk alleles. The problem is, you know, you typically need samples from a huge number of people to make these GWAS work and to really power them appropriately. But here they're using iPSCs. Okay, iPSCs. And I believe a, just a few hundred iPSCs as opposed to thousands and thousands of individuals that normally are associated with genome-wide association studies. So derived iPSCs um, and, and identified through this in vitro GWAS is what they call it, uh, a cluster of single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs in a regulatory region of the NDUFA4 gene, which is actually also associated with enhanced susceptibility to Zika virus infection, which is what they, they showed in an organoid model. When, they, when you have a loss of NDUFA4, there is a decreased susceptibility to Zika virus infection, also a decreased susceptibility to dengue virus, and probably part of the reason it's in cell stem cell now, a decreased susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is, of course, the virus that causes COVID. Um, they generated isogenic lines that actually carried non-risk alleles of, of SNPs or deletion of the cis regulatory region in this NDA, NDU FA4 gene and showed that there was a lower susceptibility to, to viral infection. And they dove into a little bit more, showing that the, the loss or reduction of NDU FA4 actually is causing mitochondrial stress in, in the cells. Uh, the cool thing there is that mitochondrial stress, this leakiness in the mitochondria, is activating interferon response. And interferon response, as we know, is really critical for regulating viral mediated protection. So high interferon activation basically activates the, the cellular in, in, innate immune response, which can protect a virus from uh, sorry, protect a cell from being infected by a virus like SARS-CoV-2 or or so on. So I liked how they they tied the the mechanism really li nicely there. How the NDUFA4 mutations could actually lead to uh, protection against viral infection because of this you know interferon response activation. And so I think it, in in addition to the amazing assays and the approaches that they did here. I think it's a cool proof of concept for using GWAS, genome-wide association studies, in vitro in the context of IPS models. So you don't necessarily have to have a massive hyper-powered GWAS from patients or from people with tens and hundreds of thousands of people. You might be able to do similar studies just in vitro using the IPSCs that we all use and love, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's so much more practical, right? The scale is smaller. Um, and you get more for your buck. That's my takeaway from this. Uh, first of all, I'll just say Zika had me really freaked out, okay, relative to COVID even. I wasn't that twisted on, on COVID as I was to Zika because the, 
the, you know, I got young kids and I like to think that my brain still got some growth. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see that it's back in the news. And even if they had to add a little, uh, coronavirus element here to dust it off and make it relevant in a high profile journal like cell stem cell. But yeah, as you said, in terms of conceptual, uh, application of, of a tool i love this you know gwas and a dish means so much more than just the, the practicality of working with cell lines i think the idea and, and this was so cool too another reason why this went to csc is because they had that mechanism right the, as you described the mitochondrial stress and the interferon response so all in one they don't only make the link and identify a novel gene but they get right into the mechanism there because they got the cells to work with so I have to say, this is really, uh, you know, the future of GWAS. I don't know why you would do anything else. This is, is such an amazing example of the power of cells in a controlled system. And of course, there's other reasons for GWAS. So you genetic people don't go crazy on me. Don't want to get any kind of hate mail. But I'm just saying, this is a whole other level of, of, of resolution analysis and control. So very impressive for my partner across the street, Shu Bing. I'm going to get you on the show soon. You're a rock star. Yeah, absolutely. We need to get Shubing on the show. I don't know actually why she hasn't been on the show yet. It's probably personal. Shubing, forgive me, please. I don't know what I did, but come back. <laughs> I blame you then. Right. But I agree with you. I mean, this is a it's a really great concept. And you can definitely extend this to beyond looking at genes and SNPs that can enhance or mediate viral infection. Shubing Chen does a lot of diabetes related research too, right? And so maybe you can identify some some SNPs and some pathways in, in that way too. A big cohort of iPSCs do this quote genome wide association study in a dish and see what pops out. Hmm. Yes, yes, yes. She's doing it all over there. And, you know, one thing I'm waiting for her to get to is the blood because I need her to fix that for me too. Uh, but you know, it's going to be a challenge if, if the thousands of hematologists that have already given a crack at it, have anything to say, and that's because it's, it's a hard nut to crack. Um, I've talked ad nauseum on the show about the challenges to hematopoiesis, and we'll probably get to that a little bit with Stefan in a minute. So I'm not going to belabor it just to just say that, as you know, that in mice, at least it's between E8.5 and 10.3. 2.5, a very specific window where endothelial cells undergo this endothelial to hematopoietic transition to generate hematopoietic stem cells, okay? The God cell. And uh, it's a mystery as to what happens next. Um, we know that pretty well, but how those cells expand and become the entire uh, cohort of hematopoietic stem cells that uh, account for hematopoiesis throughout the adult lifespan, relatively poorly understood. Um, just to put some numbers on it. So in, in a day between embryonic day 10.5 and 11.5, in that little window, there's like one or two, literally one or two transplantable HSCs um, per embryo. Uh, and next though, they migrate to the fetal liver and blow up, right? And that's the dogma that there's this massive wave of proliferation that establishes the HSC pool in the fetal liver. Uh, and then later on, it goes to the bone marrow, et cetera. And this is a four-day window between E11.5 and 15.5. You get an expansion of about a, a thousand fold uh, of the HSC pool. And that's thought to be due to expansion of these phenotypic HSCs in the fetal liver. But the thing is, is that that's not always the case. In humans, for example, it's been shown by other means that most of the expansion of hematopoietic stem cells takes place postnatally. So there's a lot of mystery and it's important, right? Because there's a huge amount of studies in search of the, the God cocktail that'll allow for expansion or derivation of the God cell, hematopoietic stem cell. There's all these factors that have been implicated, all these exogenous factors, angiopoietin, wnt, efferin, you know, the list goes on. There's like 20 of these things. But when you take any one of these proteins and try and use them to clinic, clinically expand or expand HSCs in a clinical context for transplantation purposes, none of them work. None of them are used clinically. So we have all these ideas, but none of them really are in practice in, in a way that works. Um, and as I said, there's a lot of evidence in both mouse and human to suggest that embryonic HSCs um, with lifelong blood potential may not be exclusively expanded 
in the fetal liver. Okay, so that's the backdrop. There's some some questions, some debate, but like the the I'd say the the major force of the dogma is that the fetal liver is the site. All right, that is until Shannon McKinney Freeman, who's at St. Jude's Children's St. Jude Children's Hospital at uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, she decided to get after this and used a, a suite of tools, a confetti reporter combined with this ubiquitin, this tamoxifen inducible ubiquitin Cree, as well as a dox inducible H2G, H2BGFP uh, Cree. So all these, um, not Cree, but allele, looking at, at ways to track cells and, and do lineage tracing. And what they show to upset the, the dogma is that indeed uh, the, the pool of faded progenitors, and that's key, functional HSCs expands only twofold during it within the fetal liver, okay? That's next to what people thought was hundreds of folds, so only twofold. Um, and they showed through these paired daughter cell assay that although there's a lot of these cells apparently, these phenotypic HSCs that expand, the, the majority of them are biased to differentiate rather than self-renew and therefore don't account for the HSC pool that's present in the adult. And that's it. I mean, this is a, a nature cell biology story, so high impact, I think, because they use really complex and elegant uh, tools to upset a very widely held dogma with a much more simple, uh, a simple explanation for HSC expansion, which is that it expands uh, across the board in multiple niches, and the fetal liver isn't really ground zero. And why is this important? Well, for me, because all that effort that's spent using uh, investigating these secreted factors, um, we may need to look at, at another site, another niche. There may be other factors that are critical to HSC emergence and expansion and self-renewal. And, and I think uh, that now we can start ticking factors off of another list. So thanks to the McKinney Freeman Lab, I think we've got another target. Another HSC paper that terrifies me based on the importance of the niche in specifying these things, right? And we talked about this, I believe, as recently as our previous roundup. It tells you, yeah, I mean, in addition to the amazing, you know, lineage tracing and uh, tracking approaches that they did here, ultimately, it's it's telling you, yes, that, that the niche is important and it's critically important. And if you hope to replicate this phenomenon in vitro and terms of human pluripotent stem cell differentiation into bona fide HSCs, you have to incorporate some element of the niche in some way, whether it's an exogenous factor, whether it's some sort of transgenic approach, I don't know, but it's, it's complex. And let me tell you, I'm just happy. I'm not the one working on these differentiation approaches, trying to turn IPSCs into bona fide HSCs because it scares me, man. It really does. Yeah, it's scary and demoralizing. We're going to have to talk to Stefan about his uh, experience with developmental hematopoiesis. I mean, it's a bear and it has, you know, crushed more scientists than just me. But the answer is out there, Rune, and I don't think it's long for discovery. I think we're getting there. Absolutely. There's so many folks working on this that I'm, it's viewed as a holy grail. Absolutely. But I'm sure we're going to get there within the next five to 10 years. I'll be optimistic. How about that? So staying in kind of the, the blood realm here, this is a blood adjacent story, but I think a very neat kind of pseudo engineering approach. Uh, this is looking at engineering human mini bones. This is a pretty unique approach for the standard standardized modeling of healthy hematopoiesis, leukemia, and solid tumor metastasis. This is coming from Paul Bourgeon's lab. First author is Annie Gregorian. It's a STM, Science Translational Medicine paper, so it's a very decent, you know, good impact, high impact uh, study that they've got here. They're talking about the bone marrow and different model systems that may be able to replicate some of the, the hematopoietic properties that can undergo in the bone marrow. Uh, the the microenvironment of the bone marrow, of course, has as we've just discussed, is, is providing these um, factors, so many different types of factors to sustain HSC blood production throughout life. It's a hot spot for the progression of certain types of cancers, as we know. Um, and it's also the most frequent site of solid tumor metastasis. I actually didn't know that. Mm. Um, Preclinical research relies on these xenograft mouse models, which we know and love, but these models often aren't perfect when it comes to looking at the human-specific functional interactions of stem cells with their bone marrow microenvironment. 
certainly the species specific differences, but also it's always good to utilize a human model system. I'm biased, of course, but in my mind, utilizing some sort of humanized model system is, is, is a good thing. So human mesenchymal stem cells, as we know, are which are adult derived, can be exploited for the in vivo engineering of different humanized niches, which could actually incur, confer robust engraftment of healthy human tissues and perhaps even looking at blood cancers as well, human blood cancers. But mesenchymal cells, as we know, are not always the most reproducible cell type okay it's it's gotten kind of a black eye over the years and even mscs in some way it, it, you don't even want to talk about them in a lot of ways because they're we don't they're so heterogeneous that that's the the big issue with these guys right so they're associated with some major reproducibility issues in tissue formation uh, but here they are showing the fast and standardized, again, very important, generation of human, quote unquote, mini bones by a custom designed human mesenchymal uh, cell line. Okay. And what they call these things humanized ossicles or HOS, which I, I really like that acronym, uh, which consist of fully mature humanized bone and bone marrow structures uh, hosting a human mesenchymal niche with intrinsic stem cell properties. Okay. And they compared it to mouse bones um, and showed that the, the humanized bone had a superior engraftment and also a superior engraftment of human cord blood derived hematopoietic stem cells and uh, primary acute myeloid leukemia samples. Okay. So they have the cancer angle in there too. Um, and the other, I think, very cool part of this, again, alluding to what I don't know when it comes to tumor metastasis, they showed that. Uh, it's this hoss, this you know, humanized ossicle can serve as a metastasis site for breast cancer cells. So they added the hoss in the in these mice and the rodents, and they also introduced the breast cancer model and showed that there's a motion, there's a movement of the breast cancer cells into the 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 bone, the bone marrow niche, the transplanted bone marrow niche. And finally, they actually took that a step further and reported the engraftment of a neuroblastoma patient derived xenocraft cells in a humanized model which is actually able to recapitulate the clinically described osteolytic lesions that are associated with neuroblastoma. So I think this is really exciting. I think this is super cool. It's not a topic I know a ton about, but the fact that you can create these customized bones, humanized bones, introduce them into a mouse model, and then from there, use this as a model for tumor metastasis, uh, and, and it actually works across multiple different cancer types. I think that's such a powerful preclinical platform that you can look at for, you know, leukemias and all different types of cancers, solid tumors, right? Uh, so super exciting and very unique, very unique approach to me. Yeah, this is such a cool story to me, like metaphorically, the bone, people don't recognize the complexity of the bone think of it I, I think of it as like endothelium people think of it it's just a conduit for the blood but it does a lot of stuff bone is not just a structural support and we know this already as scientists but like this really underscores that point and here whereas i think most people would hear think mini bones and immediately go to like an engineering or kind of like you know orthopedic application here as you are saying that the cancer metastasis angle here i think is so awesome and really is going to make a big deal change in terms of how we address and perhaps even personalize our treatment for cancers. Um, so I love it in terms of clinical translational. And, and I'm really happy for MSCs. Uh, as you started by saying, they really have gotten a black eye, uh, you know, between the anniversa stuff with the, the heart and all the terrible, you know, Tur medical tourism with the enucleation of eyes and whatnot, the people injecting mesenchymal stem cells willy-nilly. But I think th th it's a great, uh, I like how we've come around because the reason why there was so much, I guess, malfeasance in, with the MSCs is that they're so accessible, right? And so that's why this is such an important story and why I guess MSCs have been, uh, you know, misallocated in the past, clinically speaking, um, is because they're there, they're readily available, and notwithstanding the heterogeneity issues, which I think are being addressed and at least acknowledged, uh, the differentiation potential and clinical translational potential, as illustrated here, seems boundless. So I'm happy for MSCs, and I'm happy for, for us, 
uh, who get to benefit from all the research that'll be done on them. Embassies get their day in the sun here, that's for sure. And I think the other, bringing it back to the the tumor metastasis model, uh, the fact is you can use this for any model, any model of sol solid tumor metastasis, whether you're looking at breast cancer, whether you're looking at neuroblastoma, whether you're, any sort of system I think could be could be uh, enhanced here by using this this Haas approach. So I, I can't wait to see what they what they do next with this, and I, I mean that genuinely. I, I, it's just such a cool model system here. Yeah, I mean we're talking about metastasis to a human cell destination, guys. This isn't you know xenograft tumor model. This is xenograft and then to a human site. So awesome. Uh, really changing the world. These guys very impressive. Uh, can't wait to see what comes next. Before we get to our interview with Stefan Irian, who's doing a lot of other things to change the world. I have a quick message from Stem Cell Technologies. Are you attending an upcoming cell or gene therapy conference? Enter to win up to 500 US dollars from Stem Cell Technologies toward your registration fee. Contest closes on November 30th, 2022, and is open to residents of select countries only. You'll have to look at the details to see about that. Full eligibility rules can be found on the registration form. Visit www.stemcell.com slash 2022 conference award to learn more. All right, everybody. Today, we have a special guest with a unique insight into what we all care about, which is translation of cellular therapies. Dr. Stefan Irian, who is Senior Vice President of Research at Blue Rock Therapeutics. Dr. Irian is an accomplished cell biologist, doctor, and project team leader. Uh, he's run a successful pluripotent stem cell research program, both in academia and industry, and he's currently the Senior Vice President of Research at Blue Rock Therapeutics, a leading engineered cell therapy company with a mission to develop regenerative medicines for intractable diseases. Blue Rock Therapeutics cell and gene platform harnesses the power of cells to create new medicines for neurology, cardiology, and immunology indications. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. I think Blue Rock is really a, a breakthrough company that's uh, going to set the standard for pluripotent stem cell translation across the board. This is such an exciting episode for us. Stefan, thank you so much for being on the show today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. This is really a great opportunity. I'm, I've been looking forward to this uh, recording for a while. Um, really, really grateful to have a, a forum here and, and and speak to the audience. We feel exactly the same way. Let's get right into it. So we don't have to explain to the audience, or at least the lion's share of the audience, they know about Blue Rock Therapeutics, but a, a quick review about the details. Founded to 2016 by giants in the field, Lorenz Studer, Vivian Tabar, Gordon Keller and Michael Laflamme, bought by Bayer for $600 million in 2019 in what was seen widely as a watershed endorsement of the commercial and translational potential of pluripotent stem cells. What is your role there? And perhaps could you give us some examples of the most mature therapeutic pipelines that are under development? Yeah, uh, Happy to. So, you know, I, I oversee all the research functions within Blue Rock. And I think what, what makes our company unique is that we're really not focused on a single asset. Um, so we're really trying to showcase what pluripotent stem cells and regenerative medicine uh, with the cell therapy can do. And um, we've obviously put a lot of effort into uh, our two leading programs, Parkinson's and, and heart failure, based on our scientific founders, because they really, you know, captured that, that moment of, of bringing good science to patients um, and, and um, you know, having the right cell, uh, bringing it to the right patient uh, always made a lot of sense um, to us as a company. So, you know, we, we as most people know, we are, um, our leading program is our Parkinson's program uh, where we've successfully enrolled a trial of 12 patients uh, in two countries. Uh, so really excited about that. Um, we're obviously standing by for the data to come in on these on these patients, and you know when the time is right, we'll we'll release some of that data. Um, I'm sure everybody understands that um, this is this is you know we need to wait for the outcomes of, the, of of before we can talk about it. But pretty excited to do that for the first time, showcasing that we can uh, engraft uh, um, dopaminergic neurons uh, into patients with Parkinson's disease, um, and and a lot needed to happen for that to work out. Um, and so pretty excited about that. 
Yeah, it's no secret that we're in the midst of this revolution when it comes to translational applications of pluripotent stem cells. And Blue Rock is one of the most prominent examples of biotech companies that are actually bringing stem cell derived products and cell therapies to people via rigorous clinical trials, as you're alluding to. I mean, as somebody who's really in tune with these recent advancement in technologies in cell therapy, what do you think are the most important factors that have contributed to the the rapid movement of cell therapies into the clinic, especially over the last decade? Is it mostly a science and technology driven enterprise, you know, when it comes to the adaptation of these, these cell therapies, but, or do you think also important is the greater acceptance of cell therapies in the medical and general public, you know, the, the overall feel for the field. So you know, is it a combination of these things? So what do you think are these most important factors? Yeah. You know, I, I think with, with any te- technological advancements, it's, it's, it's always a combination of things, right? Um, there needs to be this, uh, this landmark finding that captures the imagination of, of the public to get this acceptance. And I think, uh, while we've had seen uh, some trials in the past that were maybe less of, less less um, effective in in the end, things like the CAR T cell field really have you know captured the, our clinicians' imagination, uh, pharmaceutical industry's imagination, and the patients' imagination that a cell therapy can do something. Right? And obviously, our therapies are are quite different in, in from from my point of view. Right? We're we're treating degenerative diseases and, and not cancers, but we, we've been able to see that cell therapies can have an impact uh, to the patients and, and, and the families of patients. So that was one part, but then also having the technology, right? right? If we think about the, the early days of pluripotent stem cells, and people probably uh, rolled their eyes and said, oh, uh, retroviruses and you know, insertional mutagenesis and all, all that, that geeky stuff that can happen. Well, we've seen now that we, we can actually overcome these issues very, quite readily with, with mRNA reprogramming and, and other technologies. And so by these elements coming together, um, both on the technology side, but also on the patient acceptance side and in, in, in the buy-in from the physicians to bring these therapies to patients, I think that's what really enabled us to see this, this field advancing at the speed that it's advancing now. Yeah, you mentioned all these kind of archaic technologies are archaic now, but really important uh, stepping stones of the process. And I want to take you back. Uh, in, in your own timeline to a paper in Nature Biotech that came from your stint at uh, Keller Lab at the McEwen Center. Um, I guess that's where you guys got set up together uh, and the rest is history. But I can remember that story vividly myself because gene targeting in the ES cells was a major challenge. Uh, yeah. and it was tough for us to break through. I personally was trying to make a bunch of reporter lines uh, using your specific HR cassette. So thank you in advance. Although uh, it still hasn't worked out. So I say thank you in advance because 20 <laughs> years on, I'm, I'm still trying to get those banged in there. But it's no fault of the technique. I mean, you really nailed it there. But at this point, it must seem like Lego Duplo next to the stuff that you're doing now. Uh, but, you know, as you alluded to, we were able to break through. But there's still many hurdles, right? Uh, what is or what are the, the greatest challenges to genetic manipulation of cells for therapeutic ends? Or, or have we really broken through to where we are now on the precipice? Uh, or, or is there some, a few, a few hurdles left to fall? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that always depends on your, on the vantage point, you know, and uh, maybe, you know, uh, to reflect on your story, it's qu- quite funny when I listen to some of our scientists today complaining that the efficiency is only 60% and they have to, you know, screen 50 colonies. I got like, do you know how many I screened by Western blot and didn't get anything? You know, so it really depends on your view. Um, I think what we've seen with the CRISPR technology and, and other advancements uh, in, in, in transfecting these cells, culturing these cells, you know, culturing single cells without feeders, imagine that. Um, it, it, and it really enabled us to do make huge progress on, on the basic science side, right? Understanding mechanisms of disease and so forth. So there, I think the technology is, is quite ready. Uh, from for us, from a from a commercial and clinical perspective and pharmaceutical perspective, to to really bring this into patients, the standards are obviously much higher. We really need to think about how can we characterize these cells, how can we have a good look at the genome um, um, to understand what what have we done beyond inserting that genetic material that we want to do. Um, is is that still a safe therapy? And we all know, I think as scientists, we, we appreciate, you know, the, the more we look, the more we find. And, and, and we often find ourselves 
trying to find the balance between scientific curiosity and things we can also understand and, and, and explain uh, to a regulator what we find. So it's, it's that, that fine measure. And there we, we have still some work to do to, to overcome this. I think you know, we obviously have a plan forward for the company uh, that we want to bring forward. Uh, but that hasn't really been, um, you know, translated into the clinic at, at scale. Hmm. Yeah, let's stay in the realm of new technologies right now, you know, and going beyond genetic manipulation of cells and such. And we certainly love discussing new technologies here on the show. And we've reflected about how these recent cutting edge technologies, like what we've been discussing here, whether it's genome editing, iPSCs, organoids, so on, they've really contributed to this current golden age of stem cell biology, as we like to call it. And as somebody with a highly clinical orientation, but are you know, also with an exceptionally strong basic science pedigree, what are the specific technologies, whether it's you know genome editing or else uh, something else, that you're the most excited about when it comes to their potential to better human health? Yeah, I, I I do think that you know the organoid world um, has really, from to accelerate our basic understanding of certain diseases is, is really exciting because what we can do there is is really decipher the mechanism of of disease and the mechanism of action of potential drugs because we can we can for the first time basically create a human model in a dish and we can mix and match different cell types of of different genetic origin or maybe with corrected genetic origin so we can see is the is the is the cell that's failing or causing the disease uh, for example the the oligodendrocyte or is it the neuron right because we can we can pair wild type uh, with an with a defect uh, defected uh, cell of, of other origin which normally you can't do right you can do that in animal models but then you question is the animal model representative of the human disease um, here you can you can do that in a dish so I think that's pretty exciting. Um, and obviously, the readouts of those are, uh, assays are, are, are really only able because we, we have amazing imaging technologies, I mean, and we have amazing uh, technologies to interrogate the genome by single cell RNA -se sequencing, ATAC-seq, you name it, all these uh, uh, fancy methods. And I, I, I'm still catching up on, on all the new technologies that are coming out there. Yeah, so are we. I mean, that's the great thing about this show is every couple of weeks we get to, we're forced to review it. But I mean... As, as you guys are talking about, the tech nowadays really blows the mind. These ground up approaches with the synthetic embryos and, and combining that with the high resolution analysis, it really is uh, a glorious time to be a scientist and, mm -hmm. and I think a, a physician. You know, mm -hmm. the idea that, that medicine is going to be completely transformed in the next few decades um, and the way we treat it, it's already underway with these cell based therapies. It's really exciting. Um, and nothing, something I would never would have predicted uh, when I was geeking out in the lab. I, I didn't think that we'd be so close to the clinic and have such relevance to actually changing people's lives therapeutically. And, and I imagine maybe it was a similar situation for, for you. You're, you're among a, a substantial wave of academically uh, trained scientists um, that have taken on the challenge of moving these cell-based therapies to people, but your academic training is pretty unconventional. I mean, you you were uh, you know a, a doctor trained as a medical doctor, and uh, I can relate to that a little bit. I don't know about your path, but my postdoctoral mentor Shaheen Rafi, a great scientist, great man. If you're listening, Shaheen, love you, man. Uh, but he was an MD practicing hemonk. Um, and just got so deep into it with the patients, really fell in love with his patients and was so frustrated by the fact that he couldn't address their problems um, that he turned to biology and ultimately walked away from patient care. Uh, so I, I guess I have this romanticized view of the physician turned scientist that they they feel it maybe a, a little bit deeper um, or they have a deeper understanding of what the problem is, whatever it is. Uh, I find it to be a, a unique or, or, or maybe a, a, a scientist that is uh, in the minority, not represented so well. So great to have you on the show. I'd like to hear what drew you away from traditional medicine um, and what set you on this path. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know that Shaheen and I had, had so much in common. I guess you know <laughs> now that you tell his story, um, uh, I know him. I know him quite well. Obviously, living in New York, you know, we've we've had frequent encounters. Um, it was probably very something very similar, right? Where, um, you know, working um, as a clinician, um, in doing your rounds on a daily basis, uh, talking to the patients and seeing, especially in the uh, in the oncology space, how how patients would 
you know, be there for weeks, if not months, and, and, and often know their destiny or undergo really, uh, you know, potentially curative, but also very heroic uh, treatments such as bone marrow transplantation, which, you know, if, if the outcome is good, it obviously is fantastic. But I've all seen you know, people, people uh, suffer through these um, therapies. And, and um, so it's, it's a long road. And um, doing that, you know, I, I only did this for, for a short period of time during my training, but um, it, it led me to believe that um, maybe my time is better served by, by finding medicines that could, you know, even though it may take me uh, many, many years to discover one and, 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 and bring one to the patients, I could have a larger impact uh, on many patients rather than serving uh, you know, these handful of patients, which obviously all are individual cases that, that you know, touched me at the time, but um, that ultimately it was, a, it was a smaller pool and I felt like I could have a bigger impact by, by going into basic research and ultimately um, uh, a biotech company to bring these therapies into the clinic. Mm. Yeah, speaking of you know, the patient side of things, you have a profound connection to the work that you do. You've actually shared in the past that your father suffered the incremental loss of his active life and ultimately succumbed to Parkinson's disease. And I'm sure this is, you know, pretty tough to talk about, but you must realize by now that these kind of stories of yours and your father's are really quite an inspiration, not just to patients and advocates, but to other scientists as well. So how does it, you know, how do you feel about going after this every single day in a time and a place where you can actually move the needle on a disease like Parkinson's disease that has affected your own life and along with countless other lives as well. It's something that, uh, you know, impacts us all. We, we and many biotech companies and even academic centers do this as well, where you bring in patients, right? And, and building that connection, I think, is something that sets our area of work academic academic work and, and, and biotech and industry work apart from, from something like working in Wall Street, right? Where you sometimes, I have friends that say like, I don't know why I go to work. I, I make money by using other people's money to make more money. It, it, the motivation is completely different, right? If we can connect uh, me personally, uh, uh, my dad um, and, and, and other patients that we bring into the company uh, to really show what, what are these what is the problem of these individuals uh, and these patients? Uh, and often we bring their, their caregivers as well to see um, that creates an incredible connection and, and an, an incredible mission for everybody that works on these diseases because it, it puts it right in your face. The, you know, there is a, a patient that represents, depending on the disease, you know, uh, an orphan indication or, or, or hundreds of thousands of patients. And they're waiting for the therapy today. They're there to speak to you, to motivate you. Most of them have acknowledged that the therapy that we are developing will not help them anymore, but they're there to convey on behalf of the other patients um, wh why we should be working on it. It's incredibly motivating. Um, it motivated me on a personal level and it, it motivates everybody around me. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, Arun, I'm sure you've been there too, but I can remember papers that we publish at whatever level. And there's always a little flurry of emails that you get from patients who are affected either directly or are affiliated with whatever you're working on. And that's the, the really inspiring thing is that oftentimes, you know, of course, there's always some note of, of hope. Is there any way that this could apply to me? You have any trials or whatever? But the really inspiring thing and stunning from, from my standpoint, because I don't get a lot of patient interaction, is how many of them are just emailing to volunteer themselves or their cells uh, to further the research. And you just realize how many people are a part of this thing we do. It, it really um, it really makes you feel it. Um, moving away a little bit um, from all these fields, I, I got a question, a requisite question, my apologies, but hailing from the Keller Lab, you have, of course, dabbled in developmental hematopoiesis. And of course, I, I ask most developmental hematologists who join us some kind of annoying question along the lines of, when are we going to generate a true HSC from pluripotent stem cells? Something like that, or similarly insipid uh, question that doesn't have a really good answer. But for you, I have a question with a bit more flavor, uh, which is, do, does it really even matter? I mean, this whole idea of getting the bona fide, some people are so... They got the blinders on, but as the, the science emerges and we learn more, I wonder, can we do just fine with many immune-based therapies, at least, maybe not stem cell transplant, but with a lot of these immune, where we harnessed the, the power of the immune system with those types of therapies, 
Do you think we can get there by using engineered hematopoietic derivatives that are made from human pluripotent cells at scale? I mean, without revealing anything that's going on on Blue Rock, just in terms of concept, do we need the HSC? Yeah, you know, good question. I think um, I still believe that this would be, you know, having it would open uh, opportunities of, of application for these cells as well. I think the field has been um, said back so many times on this that it's it's it it seems like something unobtainable and we haven't really thought through the applications. Um, I believe that many of these patients uh, would really benefit from having something that's off the shelf and ready to go. Oftentimes, you know, we in 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 aggressive cancers, we need to think through how quickly we can provide a treatment, right? Um, so if having something that you'd pull out of the freezer that's readily available, uh, that could really accelerate um, uh, the, uh, the treatment of, of these patients. I'm thinking about access to these therapies, right? I mean, we think uh, potentially a bone marrow transplant is something we, we can do and that that'll be the cure for some patients. But think about uh, in developing countries, how accessible is that therapy? Could we have something there that is off the shelf, incredibly cheap to manufacture, um, that then could be could be given to those patients. So, so I still see tremendous value in that, and I think having it, um, and especially combining it with 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 gene editing and gene engineering. So not just editing out potential genetic defects, but engineering the cells to to have sort of superpowers. Uh, I think that 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 is really something that we could um, still bring to the uh, to patients. Uh, I'm going to let you go in a minute here, but just want to say before we do, this has been such a great conversation for us and such a cool opportunity to get into your head. I wish we could talk forever. Uh, and just to close, we're going to ask a couple of uh, science affiliated questions because you gave us so much about the work. We want to know a bit more about you. First one is, uh, if you were not a scientist, God forbid, or, or a medical doctor, I don't want to live in that world, but if you weren't one of those, what, what would you be? Yeah, I, uh, I thought about this question, you know, because we, we had talked about it. Um, so astronaut is the answer. It's a simple answer. And I'm laughing because it, the, the people on the show can't see what I see in Aaron's background, but you know, there's obviously uh, a Saturn V rocket Lego supermodel <laughs> that's that's taller than life. Um, yes. um, you know, and I, I always thought it would be cool. You know, it's, it's science, it's technology. It's really pushing the boundaries. Um, I mean, it's a unique story to tell. I would, you know, I would be on a, uh, on many podcasts if I would be an astro astronaut. So um, I think that's cool. Um, and um, yeah, astronaut is the answer. Well, that makes two out of three of us. Although I think uh, Arun <laughs> may be trying to do the actual science astronaut thing, like in this one career. And I, I, I'm I'm thinking if anyone can do it, it, it's him. His his ideas are really out of this world. Ha -ha. Probably aged out of that one now. So yeah, yeah stay well, tuned. <laughs> there's still time. They put William Shatner up there for God's sake. <laughs> uh, finally, we got a kind of three parter here. Lucky for us, fill in the blanks. When I am not conducting research, I am. Exercising, because that is the best pill ever. Yes, very fit. You wouldn't know when you see him bobbing around with his platinum hair through all these conferences, but that platinum hair belies his tremendous fitness. He may be old in his crown, but he is young in his satellite cells. Are those the muscle ones? I'm, I'm going too far. <laughs> Next, if I could have one superpower, it would be. Yeah, it'd be, uh, you know, I was looking up the Marvels because I don't know all, all the characters and, and there's a character, Elektra is a superhero and I guess he's evil. So I, I'd like to be the, <laughs> the non-evil uh, version of Elektra because I think bringing energy to the world uh, at unlimited uh, supplies would, would solve many of our problems and conflicts. So Elektra is my superpower. That's such a good and practical answer. I tell all the trainees here who leave my lab because clearly I ruined them for science. You should go into physics maybe next because that's the great problem facing our world next. So Bizarro Electro, that's what we have for you. And I think uh, that's a great answer. Finally, I cannot start my day without. Coffee, black. Hmm, keeping it simple, I love it. Yep. Well, my friend, uh, it's about midday where we are right now, but go get yourself a cup and get back to cranking on those cells. We're counting on you and uh, we're grateful for all you've done and all you've shared with us uh, on the show today. 
It really is a delight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me and letting me allow to represent what I've done. But, you know, honestly, uh, the entire team has done here. So that brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. We had a giant in the field from a giant industrial partner of stem cells looking to change clinical translation. And uh, we'll have another fine guest for you in a couple of weeks. Thank you guys for listening.